There's some animals we eat and some animals we don't. I, for one, I, I won't eat Bambi and I won't eat Thumper. Um, and, and of course, we, we don't eat Felix the cat or Lassie the dog, but chickens and pigs and cows, and I, I think cows are quite good looking, Elsie the cow, but it's interesting, and, and this is the subject of the book of our next speaker, Erica Ritter. Erica? Thank you, Moses. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I, I will not be playing the piano, although I do understand the piano will be played later. I, I really am in incredibly gratified to be asked to be part of uh, this wonderful event, and also particularly to be in a group of, of other speakers, as you will hear, who are involved with issues to do with humans' relationship to the rest of the world. And there's a huge rest of the world that, that doesn't include us. In fact, the majority of, of life on this planet isn't human. And yet we are so dominant in our own thinking of who we are and in our control of all these others that we tend to think of ourselves as, as kind of the primary species on earth. I've written this book called The Dog by the Cradle, The Serpent Beneath, which is about what I see as the paradoxes in our relationships with animals, based exactly on what Moses uh, was just saying, that we have different ways of classifying animals, classifying our feelings about them, and even the same animal can be treated differently at different points in its relationship with us. This has fascinated me as a writer. I've been a fiction writer primarily and a dramatist, but tensions between characters, conflict between character, and conflict internal to character and to people uh, whether the character be a person or an animal, has interested me as a writer. And so I, I wanted to write a book about how we try to resolve the paradoxes between the animals, roughly speaking, that we love and those we love to eat. And I started uh, by, by trying to come up with a sort of foundation myth on which this this paradox or the series of paradoxes could be built. And I remembered when I was about 10 years old, like a lot of kids, I was not allowed to have a dog and like a lot of people um, who have been denied anything, dog or not, I learned to sublimate through literature. So I would go to the Regina Public Library, I grew up in Regina, and get those big anthologies of dog stories that uh, were on the shelf. One story in particular that I read when I think I was about 10 years old stayed with me, and it is a story unlike any other, I think, in, in the way it depicts our relationship with animals that we purport to love. It's a story about a nobleman who has a faithful greyhound, and the nobleman has married, he has a wife, and a child, and the dog has become the guardian of the child. So the man thinks nothing of it one day. He sets out with, with his wife on a day's trek somewhere. The dog is left to guard the child. In the absence of all the humans, a huge snake comes crawling out of a chink in the wall, slithers across the stone floor, and makes its way toward the cradle in which the baby is. The dog, being a good dog, leaps up, grabs the snake by the neck or wherever a neck would be located on a snake. It's kind of hard to tell. It's sort of all neck. And it's a large snake, so there's this great tussle between the snake and the dog before the dog is finally able to break the, the spine and fling the corpse into a corner. At that moment, um, in, in the dog's struggle with the snake, the cradle is overturned so that the baby uh, is obscured, safe um, in its blankets, but obscured from sight under this overturned cradle. At that moment, the owner of the dog and the father of the child returns, and the sight that greets him is damning in its circumstantial evidence. There is the room in disarray. There is no sign of the child. There's blood spattered everywhere, and most particularly, the dog's jaws are bloody. The dog comes toward the master, having thought he will be rewarded for a good deed. Without even a moment's consideration, the master draws his sword and slays his faithful dog. Only after the dog is dead does anybody think to right the cradle. There they find the baby safe and sound, and somebody else finds the snake is flung in the corner, its, its dead body with tooth marks, obviously, of the dog. It's then clear what really happened. 
But it's too late. The master can only be remorseful. When I read this story when I was um, 10 years old, I, I was shocked by it. It's still a shocking story when, if you haven't heard it before. It, it, it's so unfair. There are so many elements of this story that, that speak to our relationship with animals. And I think when you're a child reading a story like this, I think there's no accident that so many stories for children have animals as central figures, because I think there's a real identification between children and animals in terms of their powerlessness, their inability to control events, their inability to explain themselves. The, the great cartoonist Al Cap, who created Little Abner, once said about children, children are midgets with no money. <laughs> and it's fair, as a political statement about children, it's absolutely fair. You could say that about animals. Animals are illiterates with no money. They, they like children, often are of a smaller stature physically, certainly of a smaller stature in terms of their importance and power. And animals cannot uh, purchase the things they want or need with money. They don't have that level of control, and they cannot even explain themselves. The saddest thing about the story of the dog, the snake, the baby, and the master is that the dog comes forward expecting, legitimately enough from his point of view, that he will be praised for what he's done. And the, and the master, of course, um, kills him, much to the dog's terrific surprise. The dog would have said, if he realized what was coming toward him, he would have said to the master, no, no, you've made a mistake, look, look, right the cradle, you'll see the baby is there, safe and sound, and over here, come over here, here's the snake I killed to protect the child. But the dog is not able to do this. Not only that, there's no trial at which the dog could present his own point of view. The dog is a victim of summary justice, and it isn't even justice, it's injustice. Worst of all, there's no redress. So when I set out to write this book about the tensions in our relationship with animals, this was the story that came to my mind. And all the paradoxes that I deal with in my book really spin off this central story. The dog is trusted and a friend of man until he isn't. It all turns on a dime. At a certain moment, he is treated once more like a wild animal. Worse than a wolf, more treacherous than a wolf, because he's been a dog, you know, a wolf masquerading in dog's clothing, professing to be the family watchdog, and then kills the baby when, as soon as the master's back is turned, at least in the master's view. There, there is a wealth of, of paradox and conflict in this story. And when I started to research it, the most amazing thing I found out about the story is that it's ubiquitous in many, many cultures around the world. It isn't always a dog and a snake. In, in, there's a famous Welsh version of the story, if anybody knows the story of Bed Gellert, the, the loyal wolfhound who belonged to Llewellyn, the last Prince of Wales. Um, the, not, not the last Prince of Wales in the House of Windsor, you know, real last Prince of Wales back in the Middle Ages. Th that was a wolfhound who, in the same kind of misunderstanding, killed a wolf, and the master thought that he had killed the child, and it was only after Llewellyn had killed the dog that he realized the dog had saved the child from a wolf. So it, it's a story that in Indian cultures, the, the, the noble animal is a mongoose who attacks the snake, but then is misunderstood. It, it's, it's a story that we have told ourselves for about 2,000 years, which is what amazes me about it, that clearly there's a kind of unease in our relationship with animals that, that has caused different cultures with no connection to each other to create a story in which the dog, who should be the hero of the story, in fact winds up as the victim. That he's treated unfairly, mostly because he cannot speak. That's the basis, I think, of a lot of our compassion toward animals, certainly toward people who are interested in their, well, in their protection. The fact that they must suffer in silence, as Margaret uh, Marshall Saunders, who wrote Beautiful Joe, the story of a dog, once said, animals suffer in silence in bitter, bitter silence. And it's the kind of thing that it, it, chokes, it chokes me even to say that line, even though I've said it aloud and to myself many, many times. When I, when I started to look into the history and the prehistory of this legend, 
in order to write my book, which is not a book specifically about this story. My book is about interviews I did with people like Temple Grandin, who is the uh, American uh, professor of animal welfare, who designs humane slaughter systems. She's uh, famous also as a high-functioning autistic. The very concept of humane slaughter interests me. It's a paradox in itself. I interviewed uh, violent animal rights activists in England, people who had sent letter bombs to met the uh, people who run medical laboratories, who'd blown up trucks, who had rehomed animals by stealing them from laboratories and, and finding other homes for them. And I, I talked to people who worked with animals as cognitive psychologists and in different ways, but always exploring this idea of the conflicted relationship we have with animals because of the fact that we can be emotionally close to them and yet there are so many that we commodify and use as products. And I think for humanity, trying to square that circle, trying to get around that idea, has created all kinds of, of um, psychological tricks that help us to deal with it. That story is one of them. Another um, branch of research I looked into was how the ancient world viewed animals that were sacrificed. The dog in that story was a sacrifice. In the ancient world, um, in, in ancient India, the horse was one of the most highly regarded of sacrificial animals. And it wasn't sacrificed lightly. It wasn't just you know grabbing the animal up and cutting its throat. This was ritual. This was an animal worthy of of uh, being presented as a gift to the deity or to appease the gods or whatever the reason was. And in that world, before the priest would kill the horse, he would whisper into the horse's ear, you do not die through this. You go on paths pleasant to go on. In ancient Greece, the bull was one of the most popular and, and revered sacrificial animals. The, the altar would be spread with grain and several bulls would be brought forward, not just one, so that the first one who went for the grain became the sacrificial animal. Not because he was available and easy to grab, but because he appeared to have consented to the sacrifice. In Delphi, they would sprinkle water on the heads of the animals that they were preparing to sacrifice, and the ones who nodded their heads to get the water off their heads were considered to have consented. That's important to us. It's as important to us when we uh, you know, look at a restaurant that, that sells pork chops and outside there's a picture of a pig with a chef's hat and a fork in one hand and a knife in the other. He's not only happy to serve, he's happy to be served. That's, that's the message. Or the old Charlie the Tuna commercial from, uh, if you remember from the 1960s and 70s, Charlie wanted to be good enough, have good enough taste to be caught by Starkist, to be caught, killed, scaled, canned, put on the shelf and sold. This is what Charlie wanted. And in, uh, always at the end of the commercial, no matter how he tried to prove his good taste to Starkiss, whether with bongo drums or whatever he came up with, the little fishing line would come down with a message on it that, that would say, uh, sorry, Charlie, better luck next time. Charlie never managed to reach his ultimate goal, which was to be killed for us. And I think even in our secular world, our media-dominated world, these, these kinds of rituals are important to make us feel that this is what animals want. Now, I, when I looked into the story of the dog by the cradle deeper, I found that there is one instance in history, in recorded history, where this very thing happened with enormous consequences. In medieval France, in the 13th century, in the mid-1200s, there was a lord, apparently, of uh, 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 Viar, who, who had a dog, such as in that original story I read when I was 10. The dog saved the baby from the snake under those circumstances. The master killed him and then panicked because there was uh, great ill luck in killing a valuable dog. A greyhound was one of the most valuable of dogs. The master stuffed the body of the dog down an abandoned well in front of his house, planted a grove of trees, partly to appease the act and also to kind of hide all this from view. But God apparently saw, because the master's uh, domain fell into rack and ruin, the master and the wife and the baby all fled at a certain point, but the peasantry learned about about this dog in the well. And people began to bring their ailing children to the well to be healed by a, the dog in the well whom they came to call Saint Guinefort. Now, 
uh, there were papal inquisitions going on uh, all the time at that period. Always the, the concern in Rome was that out there in the hinterland, people were going to revert to pagan customs. So uh, a priest named uh, Stéphane of Bourbon was sent by the Pope as an inquisitor to this particular part of France. Rumors had begun to circulate that there was something weird going on in the woods. And he invited people to come to confession. He told them that, uh, about heresies involving ants and elderberry bushes and, and that this was wrong. And found out in confession, a, a woman said to him that she was part of a group of people who had gone to pray to Saint Guinefort to heal their children. And, and Stefan wrote this all out. There is a written record of this from about 1250 AD in which he said, I did not know Saint Guinefort. I leaned closer and asked her, was this some hermit or holy man? And she said he was a dead dog. So Stefano Bourbon was shocked. He went to the place. He made the, the locals show him the place where the well was. Now there was a huge grove of trees around where the, the dog had been buried. And he says, I had them cut down and burn the trees. They disinterred the dog and burned the dog. So there really was a dog. There was a dog in the well. And he was gotten rid of, and you can imagine Stéphane of Bourbon, you know, after that was done, sort of dusting his hands, thinking a good inquisitional day's work done here, <laughs> getting on his horse and riding out of town, which he did, thinking it's all over. No, the peasants, even though the dog was no longer in the well, continued to come to pray to St. Guinefort from that date until 1940 which is the last record, seven centuries, the last recorded evidence that people actually gathered. And even in 1940, they knew about St. Guinefort, the dog who had killed the snake uh, to save the baby and for his pains had been killed in return. And the idea that this dog was interceding for humanity with the heavens was an important part of the myth even in 1940. Uh, I have to cut this story short, but I will cut right to the chase. I did eventually get to go to the spot in the woods. There is a spot there. There was an archaeological dig done that established that, in fact, there were footings of a house. There was a, uh, the outline of a well. No dog, of course, because he was long dead. But the garments of all the, the children over the centuries whose parents had laid out their garments praying to St. Guinefort to save their child uh, have been found in you know, sequential layers. And there is just a grove of trees, but there's also a plaque that says the woods of St. Guinefor. On the plaque, it says the woods of St. Guinefor, where for countless centuries, the Ga a Gallic tradition of worship of rocks and, and, and water and trees went on and was prayed against by Stephen of Bourbon in the 13th century. And when I saw this, I was so gratified to see this. I was really at that spot. And it was only when I was translating this from French and writing it down, I realized nowhere on the plaque does it say that St. Guinefor was a dog. And to me, this is kind of the ultimate paradox with us and animals. They are everywhere. They are all over our world. They're on our feet. They're, they're on our plates. They're on our hearths. They're in our hearts. But at a certain level, animals are everywhere and nowhere. And it seems to me that the, the paradox we can't resolve, but that I think we should continue to work on, is that we try to resolve this by drawing closer and closer to the animals we care about, to learn more about their consciousness, to care about them, to try to improve their welfare. At the same time, we distance ourselves more and more from the animals we commodify. We put them farther into the countryside, hide them in bigger and bigger barns, because the conflict is still an unresolved conflict. And that's what I've written about in the book. I would be very glad to, to talk to anybody for, uh, who's interested in this further and um, thank you so much for inviting me to be here. Thanks.